this uh, section tonight is probably not, uh, it's probably very familiar with most people here. If you uh, teach young people, I'm sure you've probably taught a lesson on this, and, uh, and you've probably heard a lot of message preached on this. But it, it has a lot of meaning to me in the fact of uh, how God has worked in my life, and hopefully we'll get a chance to share some of that. But first of all, uh, the book of Jeremiah, of course, was written by the prophet Jeremiah. It's interesting they put his name on it. Uh, Jeremiah was a contemporary of Zephaniah and Habakkuk. He preached or prophesied before the, uh, the, the exile and sometime into the exile. And so this is one of the warnings that, that he's given to, the, to God's people that God is molding them to be what he wants them to be. And I believe God, each Christian, God allows series of events to come in their life to make them what they are. And I know that God has uh, done many things in my life to bring me to where I am today. And we, maybe we can get a chance to share a little bit as we go on. But first of all, let's look at our text. Oops, one supposed to talk into the mic. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's saying here, O house of Israel, in verse 6, cannot I with you at this potter, can I do with you as this, as this potter, saith the Lord, behold, as the, day is in the, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. You could say, well, that's, you know, I mean, if you're a little bit critic of this, you might say, well, that's not really applying to us because it's talking to Israel. But I, I need to be reminded and maybe remind you also that all scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may profit, be profitable unto him. And so this scripture, although literally we're talking that it goes to Israel. That's a little interpretation. It was to the house of Israel. But the application is, is for us. And that's what he's saying. He, he's talking to Israel or the application to Christians. Cannot God make us and mold us the way he wants to? <clears throat> uh, I've often heard that the, the, it said that, you know, can the clay talk back to the potter and say, hey, I don't like what you're doing, you know, can you do it a little differently? Now, sometimes that's maybe we ask God, God, do you really know what you're doing here? And uh, we have to say, yes, he does trust him. But let's read on a few more verses. At what instant shall I speak concerning a, a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it? And God is just saying that he can do these things. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of evil that I thought to do unto them. And at one instant shall uh, speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to build and to plant down. What God is saying here, I can build them up, I can tear them down. I can do it, you know, because I'm the, I'm the potter of the clay. I'm the one that does it. And he says, and if it do evil in my sight, in verse 10, that it obey my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now, he's saying here, he's put, he's put a condemnation on the kingdom, and he says, I can, I can build it up, I can tear it down. If I'm going to tear it down, then the people repent, then he says, I will, I will change my heart. Now, therefore, go. Speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Turn ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. God makes his condemnation. And what do you suppose, what's your answer? How do you say when God wants you to do something, uh, keep his word, do his work, whatever, what's your answer to him? How do you answer? Well, this is the way the nation answered to, Jer to Jeremiah and to the Lord. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. We will everyone do the imaginations 
of his evil heart. And so they refused to do what God said. And, uh, I, you know, you know the story about the exile and, and all through the Old Testament. And sometimes you wonder, you know, when I was saved and, and, and learning the Bible and growing, and I, I always will say, well, how could they do wrong? You know, God showed them all this stuff. Look at all the miracles. Look at the, in the wilderness and uh, in walking through the uh, Israelite, working, going 40 years in the wilderness. All the miracles that's performed like that. And what, what do we see? They fail. But I had to remind myself it was a long period of time between different things there. My life in the light of some of those things is just a short, short span. <clears throat> but uh, when I, I was... Of course, most of you probably figured I was born in Boston. Uh, yay, Patriots. Anybody else here? <laughs> oh, me. <clears throat> in case you didn't know, they won today. <laughs> you want to know the score? No. <laughs> okay, I'm moving on. I didn't watch the game, all the game, just the last of it. So let's let you know I wasn't tied to that TV today. But I was thinking about it. <clears throat> well, I, I was born in Boston. My earliest memories are being in a foster home. <clears throat> it isn't a foster home. It was like a way called a boarding home, but it was similar to what a foster home would be. My sister and I I'm a, come from a family of three, an older brother and a younger sister. My sister and I were, that's, I remember we were together in this boarding home. I don't remember any tragic things about it. I mean, we were there. I didn't know that we weren't beated, beaten. We weren't mistreated or anything like that. We were just in a boarding home. That's my beginning. Um, I, I ha was never in a home that went to church. Yeah, the, the, and uh, no, none of my family ever church. None of my family was saved when, when I got saved. But that, all that saying that, I was, that my earliest memory was, I know I started school there because I w rode on a bus. But very shortly after that, I went to live with my mother. And that's the first time I knew my mother. But as a kid growing up, if you don't know anything else, that's not a, I'm, uh, it's not a big deal. I'm, I'm not trying to look for anybody's sympathy or poor me, because to me, it was just another thing that was going on. Uh, my, uh, we were in a, a boarding home for a couple of years there. And my mother uh, got married to a another alcoholic, my dad was an alcoholic, and, and through the next uh, 10, 12 years, we probably moved about eight times, different houses. Uh, we weren't actually uh, welcomed in a lot of them. I, I, we had police come in to separate fights and things like that. But again, I, I, I don't look back at that as, a, as something bad, but there was no church, none at all. Uh, moving on to going into the Air Force, the Jenny. <laughs> and uh, I, I spent my career of four years there. Uh, something very special happened to me there. I met the love of my life. <laughs> I always think I'm very special because, you know, this was a small town in Rantoul, Illinois. A, a base probably had 18,000 men there. Most of them probably all around my age at that time. I was around 20. And uh, I met this girl. And uh, the rest is history. <clears throat> Sometime I'll let her tell the story about the motorcycle ride and stuff and how we met. But it's not, it's not for today. But we got married. Uh, we moved uh, around a little bit. And uh, my dad, who was... Uh, working at this time as a mechanical engineer, wanted me to go down to South Carolina to help him. And so we moved down to uh, Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, oh, we had our first baby in Massachusetts, our, I mean in New York. Our second one was Cliff, was born in Greenville, South Carolina. She was pregnant when we went down there. And I was there, we moved there in 67. And I was working for, the things didn't work out with my dad, was no bad thing, just, you know, we never really knew much of each other to start with. It was, growing up, it was just weekend meetings. <clears throat> and so uh, the things didn't work out working for him, and so we, I went to do the only thing I knew how to do, mechanics, you know, that's what I do, that's what I did. And so that's what I, that's what I went to work at the Ford place. 
oh, and I got into drag racing. I was helping guys race, and I loved to race. And um, at that time, uh, on, I'll speed it up. I, there's a lot going on, but at that time, a man came to my house. He was a pastor of uh, the church that was up the street. My wife had gone a little bit to that, but again, I, I had never been to it. So anyways, he came to the house and he asked me these questions, you know. He would talk, he talked about cars and drag racing and stuff like, because that's what I like doing. And then he asked me the question, if you died right now, do you know for sure if you go to heaven or not? Well, you know, I didn't know. I'm not, I hadn't been to church much. I had visited some different churches and stuff. I got tied up with a Catholic girl for a while. That didn't last, praise the Lord. Uh, but I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about church, you know. So he showed me from scripture, you know, what I needed to be to be saved. And, and then he said, he says, do you want to accept Christ now? And I could take you right to that spot. I mean, I think I could show you the, my knee prints if I left any. It was right by my couch at the, uh, where the den and I kneeled down and prayed and asked Christ to come into my heart and save me. It was on a Saturday night, November 9th, that was... 50 years ago, wow, a lot of things happened in 50 years. But what I want to let you know is, he said, you should let people know that you got saved. So you come in, will you come to church tomorrow? I said, sure, I'll go, why not, you know? And so, uh, so I went to church, and he said, there'll be an invitation given. I didn't know what an invitation was, you know, uh, you know, but they'll be after they'll be forward. He says, I'd like you to come forward and uh, tell people that you got saved. I said, it seemed like a good thing to do. My, my heart was changed. Uh, but when he left and I closed the door, the thought came into my life, my, my mind. Now what am I going to do for fun? Uh, well, that's never been a problem since then, I mean. Uh, I had a prison ministry for a short time, and the guy says, how do Christians get high on Kool-Aid and cookies, you know? Uh, maybe he should try it. <laughs> but but that's, the, that's fun. That can be a lot of fun. But <clears throat> I went to the church. I'd never been in a church with the invitation, and it seemed natural that I'd just go forward after that. So I went forward, and a lot of people come by very friendly and, and, and things like that. And I, I was happy about all this situation. Then they said, you know what you should do next? He said, you should be baptized. And I'm thinking, they're going to roll the tank out in front of the church. I'm going to have to climb up a ladder. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. This is what I thought. Not ever seen a baptism by immersion. I had no clue what they did. But my heart was open to God that I wanted to do that. Now, a little background on it. My wife was baptized with me at the same time. She was saved as a young child, but got away from God. But she was sure of her salvation. And so we were baptized together. Now, <clears throat> it's just the strangest thing. I thought this thing behind them was just a picture window. one. <laughs> But when they lead you behind there and change it, I walked up the steps to the bass up there and looked, and I said, whoa, there's steps down in that thing. I really didn't even know where I was. You know, they take you back, there's uh, all these roads, uh, steps and stuff, and you get up there, and you don't even know where. And then when they, I stepped, started stepping in, it was warm. And I, that was the second thought. And then I got down in there, and I said, oh, boy. This, a, this was a big church. I, it was about 800, 900 people in this church when I first got saved. But anyways, I, I to speed things up, God brought a lot of things in my life after this situation. Not right away. Uh, that was 1968. In 1970, I had a back surgery. I was out. I was in the hospital for two weeks. They did the surgery. Everything was supposed to be fine, and as far as I know, it was. I was out of work for six months, but and then at that, by that time, we had three children. It was, things were growing, and uh, uh, it, was, it was fine. You know, and, you know, growing up at this point, I've met people with a lot of heartache. 
But I'm not sure that anything in my life at this time would, I didn't consider tragic. It was just, I thought it was normal. But God was molding me in ways I, didn't, I, I never would have imagined. When I was uh, part of my growing up before I got saved, I would see people had tragedy. I met people who lost parents and, or friends or accidents and things like that. But I had never experienced any tragedy in my family, in my all family, except, uh, and, I, and I, you always wondered how you would treat these things, you know, because you're always trying to help somebody else get through these tragedies. My mother passed away at 66. <clears throat> we were out of town, and we had to go, she was in Florida, we went down there for that service, that was one of my first tragedies, my dad passed away shortly after that at 72. But then something tragic in Father's Day, 1989, we lost a son in a car accident. <clears throat> it was Father's Day. I don't remember the date. I just remember the day because it's a special thing. Someone knocks at the door. How do you treat something like that? I mean, <clears throat> and what I heard most people say, at the, you know, I believe God working in my heart and molding me to be what I ought to be, give me that sensitivity towards others. But, you know, I never asked why. I'm not saying that I'm real spiritual to know it, but I didn't ask why, I asked what. God, what are, you, what are you trying to teach us in our lives? What are you trying to show us, that compassion? And I, I, I'm always thinking of this, this potter making this clay all through, the, you know, this had tragedies that happened, that he's molding me. He's molding our family to, to, to be what he wants us to be. And uh, in Romans chapter 9, verse 20, Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the part of power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And if we study that section, it doesn't mean dishonorable. What it means, he makes one clay to a high place of honor, and then another, per, another person who make to a, 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 maybe a lower level. In other words, I'll probably never be a president of the United States. <laughs> they couldn't handle it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he makes, he makes people in high authority, pastors and uh, music uh, associate assistant pastor, and, you know, he's in an honorable position. But then he makes others, to vacuum and clean and, and do the other things. Now, both jobs are honorable, but one job is more elevated than the other only because of his position. And that's what he's saying. God makes us and puts us to where he wants to be, some to a place of service. Uh, it, was, it was pictured in one thing, like some of the utensils at the house. You know, uh, we had a set of china uh, Nor I can't remember the name of it. Noriaki, is that the right, the name of the china? She, don't, she can't remember either. <laughs> but anyways, it was my 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 father-in-law was over in Japan after the right after the World War into the what they call occupied Japan. He sent two 12 place settings home, one to his mother and one to his uh, wife. We ended up with both sets, 12 place settings. I mean. I don't know how many pieces were in each setting, but they were there. You know how often we use this gorgeous set? We never used it. <laughs> we gave it to one to, 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 to two of our kids and, and say, here, you use it. Now, I heard one of them used it once. But those are very honorable things. But they don't they handle nothing to the plastic cups we drink out of. and Not really plastic, but you, you got the picture. And that's the way God is in our lives. Not all of us are going to be great leaders or, or, or famous or beyond our own little circles. But some of us may. 
And that's what, but that's all God's doing. And he's forming, the, forming our lives and, and making things happen. I, when I was at the Ford, Ford dealership, we had a, a representative come from Ford Motor Company. He would be there and he would help through certain tech problems and stuff like that just to uh, help you along with different new things. And he told us one time about the assembly line at Ford. When I told him when I was a young kid, I was able to see in Somerville, Massachusetts, there was a assembly plant. We used to walk down the outside the window and watch the cars go down there. He said the parts for those cars, and this was in the uh, uh, early, late 60s, the parts for those cars were coming about a mile or two away before they hit the car. You know, and, uh, and where the doors come, and the, all these parts come together, and they come to the assembly line, and they're all slapped on the car, and, they, and it's all fine. We drive those cars every day and don't think a lot about it. You know, what, what happened, what it took to get to that point. You know, and that's the same thing in our lives. I wonder if the door could talk, talk on that car and say, you don't know what I had to do to get here, you know. Uh, I was in a truck that turned over, or, you know, uh, the assembly line people, you know, hit me with a hammer, you know, I don't know. But what could they talk about? Tragedies that they had, those parts had, but they don't speak that. All they come together and it's this beautiful brand new car that will rust pretty quickly up here in northwestern Pennsylvania, you know. But you know, you, you know what I'm saying? And that's the same thing in our lives. You don't know all the things that happened in my life to get me to this point right here. And I don't know the things that happened to you in, you in your life, but I know somebody who does. And I know somebody that's in control of that. And I know somebody that, that can help us through these, tra these things, these tragic times. Um, my, my son passed away I, in Father's Day, 89. And that was a big tragedy. That was probably one of the most tragic things, and that probably that happens in anybody's life. The only thing I, I could think would be worse was losing a spouse, because I never have but some here have, and I know you've been through that, and, uh, and that's, God's taken us through that. God helps us. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. And, you know, when I first read this verse, it sort of went back. Turn to Philippians 2.13. And, and look at that verse, Philippians 2.13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasures. What he's saying is that God works in our heart and he gives us the willing spirit to do the things that we have to do. And that's what that verse says. To will gives us the will and the ability to do his good pleasure. Now, back to the clay. Does, does the clay, can the clay say, hey, I really don't want to do that? Has God ever asked you to do something you don't want to do? You know, maybe if he asked, you'd said no, and the things happened anyways. I'm not sure. But has God ever asked you that, not the, that he wanted you to do something? I think of the young people in school and colleges and stuff. God's called you. Don't give up on the dream. And I know some of you maybe had some financial setbacks and stuff like that. I went to Bible school. I started Bible school with three children. Ended up with five at graduation. <clears throat> it's funny how that works. Uh, my wife, uh, I better not say she didn't work. <laughs> she worked hard but all at home. I had some uh, GI Bill money that helped me get through, but my last year in school, I was going to school all day and working up to 11 o'clock at night, teaching class. I was, got a chance to teach it. Uh, how did that happen, you know? You know, you look back at it, some of these things you just don't know that could happen, but God makes it happen. We can do it for, for his good pleasure or for his... Uh, benefit for his plan and I, I think in, in, my, in my situation I think about getting that well done that good and faithful servant you know N not that, that 
that I've done anything magnificent or, or that like that. I believe God's given me the opportunity to speak to other folks that have lost children. Uh, in in uh, uh, 2012, we lost our daughter to breast cancer. Another tragedy. But God, God got us through it. You know? uh, and now, when, I, when someone else tells me that they've lost a child, or somebody they love and stuff, you know, the most, when I, when I was, we were going through some of the uh, funeral experiences when people would come in and say, we're sorry, you know, what do you say to somebody? You know, I know how you're feeling. Well, well only if you've been there, you know. You can't say much at all. You can say, I'm praying for you. But that person that came up to us and said, I know how you feel. And I would, and I would, with a hug, and I'd get energy from that. I, I, I got stronger because there was some bond there that developed because they knew. They knew what happened. They knew there was a tragedy, and, and they had gone through something similar. They would say that. <clears throat> Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that who are the called according to his purpose. And, you know, I read that, y'all always used to ring that. And, and the only thing that I always would think, all things work together for good. That's all I would read. But something what, lately when I looked at this, it says, we know. Started off with, that verse says, we know. That means we know that all things, you know, all things, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, they all work together for good in, in God's plan. Now, it may not feel good like going through the plan, but God will bring you through these things. Uh, they would say that, you know, we're either getting out of a, a bad time or going into one or, or, you know, or will be going into one. So, you know, all the, you know, you say, well, nothing ever bad happens to me. Well, wow, that's good, you know. But I, when that happens, you know that. And so we have to know this. And this is what, what I, I think is I want to leave you with something, is that know that regardless of the tragedy that happens in your life, the disappointment, the discouragement, the changes, uh, whatever, that we know that as a Christian, all things, all things that work for good. I, that, this song must have come out. I can always remember preachers years long ago. Uh, you know, isn't God good? They come up here. Is it, I'm, I'm sure you've heard a lot of that. Isn't God good? And it would be a good thing. You know, they say something happened, they answered a prayer. But I lost a son. Isn't God good? You know, I lost a daughter. Isn't God good? You've lost someone that you love very much. Isn't God good? And I, we don't know. You know, the world would not understand that. But as Christians, we've got to understand that, that all things work together for good. And this is a, there's a qualification for that. To them that love God. Now, I'd ask you here if you love God you would all probably say yes. But do you love God? And to them who are the called, and with this call, this call is like an invitation or uh, a, 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 something that, uh, a calling, some's called, and that's why we're called called, because God gave me an invitation to be saved, to ask to call on him, and I accepted that invitation. And now I'm called to God. And uh, after this message this morning, I, I, I would hope that everybody in, is here tonight is called of God. Everybody that's listened. Oh, it's tremendous, Craig. I really appreciate that this morning. I don't have any car driving antidotes like you do, but uh, I did take a driving test. It's a 52 Plymouth standing shift. Passed it the first time. Three on the tree, I think that's what they call it. Well, anyways, back to that. He did a good job. I was truly challenged by it.
But <clears throat> Psalm 119, let's turn to Psalm 119. That's an easy book to find most of the time. And let's look at uh, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. In verse 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hath, hast afflicted me. Now, that affliction can be anything in your life. It could be chastisement. It could be change in direction. It could be God working, working in your heart and do something different things. But we, the afflictions that we got... It's God. He is in control. And he's one making us to be that way. And uh, my final thing tonight is in July 2013, I was looking for a church. And I was uh, attending another church in Erie. And my son and daughter were coming here, Cliff and Connie and the kids. And um, for one reason or another, I really didn't feel like I wanted to go to come here. Nothing major. <laughs> but God had different plans. On July 29th, 2013, I was riding my motorcycle Sunday night about 10 minutes to 10 and a deer jumped out in front of me. I was doing 55 miles an hour on my motorcycle. And um, it, it happened so quickly, I never saw the deer. I, I, tell everybody, I, I didn't see the deer. My son, Jamie, was behind me. He said it looked like it jumped on me, but it jumped right over the front wheel up on the motorcycle. And of course, he didn't survive, I did. And I, I can remember rolling on the ground, and he stopped behind me, and, he, and I said, what happened? I, didn't, I was in a lot of pain at that time, but I didn't, I didn't know what happened. And he said, you hit a deer. And then there was some other incident. We almost got hit by a car as I was laying in the middle of the road. They took me to the hospital, and life flighted me to Cleveland. I think I probably told the stories to some people before, but anyways, it fits in here tonight. And I get to the Metro Health in Cleveland, and after doing all the tests and stuff, the helicopter ride was cool, sort of. They had lots of pain pills or pain medicine in me at that point, so it didn't matter. But I got there in the, in, in the trauma center. The guy, after they did everything, the guy says, this is probably not going to make you feel any better. But what happened to you uh, when the things happen, people don't look this good. Well, I sure didn't feel good. Uh, most of you know in the medical world, they had uh, have five broken or cracked ribs. That hurts. You know what they do for that cracked ribs, broken ribs? Nothing. And I had a broken clavicle. Oh, sorry. You know what they do for broken clavicles? Nothing. <laughs> they put your arm in a sling just so you don't move it a lot, you know. And even the doctor, after I was recovering, he said, you don't have to wear the sling, but it'll help you in, in, in the company that people will know that you're injured because you can't see a broken clavicle and it won't wrap it up or do anything. You just have to live with it. But anyways, I say all that. that uh, um, yeah, he told me they don't look this good, and, you just, and it didn't make me feel any better. <laughs> I, I wish I was. I, I, you know, if I, if I, after I thought about it, I could have come up with some real spiritual thing like that, you know, but I was on pain medicine and hurting and stuff. And, 
they actually sent me home and, uh, the next day or two days, I can't remember what it was, but they sent me home. And then I, rec I lived in a recliner for a couple of weeks. Uh, <clears throat> but Cliff, they said all that to say, Cliff and Connie, I can remember Connie saying, She's, Dad, you need to come to this church. You know, she knew I wasn't real happy where I was going, but a few times I've been to the other church. You need to come to this church. They get preaching just like you used to. They get music just like you used to, and they did. You know, I was saved in a, in a, in a church. The pastor of the church that led me to Christ, if you know John R. Rice, this is one of John R. Rice's son-in-laws, you know. John R. Rice uh, was sort of the Lord, and he, and he came to that church to preach quite several times. And so, you know, she talked to me and, and said, you need to go. Well, there wasn't much I could do. I, mean, I couldn't even take my car out of gear, so I had to ride with somebody else, so they took me to church. <laughs> and from the very first moment that I was in here, from the music to the preaching, I was at home. I knew I'd found a church. And that's, am, am I sorry for the motorcycle accident? I might have got here anyways? I don't know. But I do know that that's one of the things that God has allowed into my life to bring me to where I am today. And if you look back at the things in your life, you need to look at them as this is God bringing you to the point in his life where he wants you. But God doesn't make mistakes. And after one of the tragedies, somebody told me that God is too good to do wrong and too wise to make a mistake. Boy, when you think that through, when you think about that kind of tragedy, you have to admit that God is in control of your life. And don't fight it. He's going to make you to what he wants for his plan and for his purpose. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your will in our lives, for the way you work, for the way you